okay good morning so uh, <clears throat> welcome to this uh, uh, first lecture of the course compressible flow and gas dynamics uh, the course code for the same is me614 and uh, uh, in this particular lecture first we will try to see some of the historical perspectives of the compressible flow and uh, uh, then we will try to define what is compressible flow and what are its major applications okay so uh, for this particular course along with me uh, saurabh patel he will be your teaching assistant so in case of any issues with the assignment submission and uh, other uh, related things you can contact him okay now let's try to see the syllabus for the course so we have uh, three lectures in this particular course per week and there is no tutorial and there is no practical so this is a sixth level course that's why you are expected to do all the uh, numericals by your own uh, in case you are finding it difficult then we can discuss the things in lectures as well okay so uh, typically the syllabus for this course is uh, divided into five different modules so the very first module is related to the introduction of the course where we will try to see particularly gas dynamics review of some basic conservation laws and then we will talk about speed of sound wave equation then uh, different flow regimes depending upon the mach number then shock wave its propagation propagation of uh, sound isentropic flow and stagnation properties etc okay then particularly we will be referring to one dimensional flows where we will be specifically talking about converging diverging nozzles shock waves moving and reflected waves blast waves wind tunnels and supersonic engines okay uh, then we have two dimensional flows where we will be specifically talking about the oblique shock wave theory conical oblique shock waves frontal mayer's expansion fans and supersonic inlets and diffusers okay then uh, particularly in flow through the pipes and so you might be knowing about uh, uh, poiseley flow coet flow etc flow through the duct so here whenever we are having compressible flow behavior so all these flows which i have just now named these are particularly for the incompressible flows okay whenever we are talking about the compressible flow then we will be having some uh, names particularly uh, signifying the specific types of the flow as fano line flow Re uh, relay pipe flow then natural gas flows in pipelines and then we will try to utilize the methods of characteristics and we will try to see the supersonic nozzles design flow this is particularly the topic under the module uh, compressible potential flows okay so this is the detailed syllabus we may slightly deviate uh, the sequence while we will be actually going through this course okay but uh, as a whole at the end of the course you will be finding that almost this syllabus is actually entirely covered okay then uh, let's talk about important aspects so what are the uh, reference books so most specifically i will be referring to jd anderson uh, and uh, the title of the book is modern compressible flows with historical perspectives so that is the uh, book which i will be mostly preferring then for numerical problems you can refer to sm yahya as well so fundamentals of compressible flows uh then there are some other books as well uh, dynamics and thermodynamics of compressible fluid flow so for few specific topics i will be referring to this book then another good book which you can refer uh, uh, that is gas dynamics uh, uh, this book also you can refer okay by e radhakrishnan and uh, uh, john and kit uh this is also a gas dynamics books that also you can actually refer okay so mostly we will be dealing all the concepts from this particular book however for few specific concepts we can go to any of the suggested reference books okay now uh the prerequisite for the course okay so for compressible flow two important things are very very important because we have involvement of the fluid so we should know the fundamentals of fluid dynamics 
and secondly we will be finding that when we introduce the compressibility to the flow then there is significant changes in other th uh, thermodynamic properties of the flow as well okay so in order to deal with the thermodynamic properties another important feature is that we will be finding that compressible flows are nothing but the high speed flows or high energy flows okay so whenever you will be finding the interaction of compressible flows with different components so there will be uh, involvement of high energies and then interactions of the energies and the fundamental science which deals with the energy and uh, energy conversion devices that is nothing but the thermodynamics so knowledge of thermodynamics is also very very important and while we will be going through the initial lectures we will try to summarize some of the basic uh, concepts of thermodynamics which will be specifically required for this course okay then comes the evaluation scheme so uh, i will try to give about four to five assignments and uh, out of these assignments only any two will be evaluated and the weightage for assignments will be 20 marks okay then we will be having mid semester exam so mid semester exam will be of 30 marks and final exam will be of 50 marks okay so we clear about the evaluation scheme we will be having 20 percentage uh, 20 marks which is for assignments 30 marks for mid semester exam and 50 marks for the final exam and particularly for assignments i will give you four to five assignments out of which you have to submit all and randomly i will evaluate any two okay <coughs> now let's try to see uh, some of the historical perspectives uh, why the need for compressible flow has come and uh, what are the developments uh, in the uh, technology which led to the actually need for the compressible flows okay so basically uh, you will be finding even if you travel in a car okay and say your car is at the speed of about 100 kilometers per hour and if you just open the window of the car and if you just put your hand just outside the window you will be experiencing a significant amount of force even though 100 kilometers per hour is not very high speed okay so i cannot call that as very high speed uh, flow but if you talk about an aeroplane okay so presently aeroplanes are having actually supersonic speeds so super the meaning of supersonic is that the speed of the aeroplane is higher than the speed of sound in that particular medium okay but uh, uh, when the uh, so you can see that aeroplanes rocket engines space vehicles then we have jet engines so in case of jet engines what you are having breton cycle based jet engines we have some compressor so where high speed flow is actually taking place uh, we have initially a diffuser section then we have a compressor okay after that we have some combustion chamber which further increases the pressure and temperature of the gases and then we have some turbine and then we have the no nozzle okay so all these devices are having involvement of the fluid in terms of the very high speeds okay but let's try to see some of the historical perspectives of aeroplanes that how uh, were actually earlier aeroplanes and then when the uh, speed has increased then how the uh, compressible flows uh, analysis has become important okay so this is a photograph of a Fokker tri-motor airliner okay so this is from somewhere in 1920s so if you see the propeller of this particular airplane is actually driven by a reciprocating engine okay so these propellers were at that time driven by reciprocating engines and this was able to achieve a maximum speed of nearly equal to 160 kilometers per hour 
so if you see the present day cars are also actually you are able to achieve even 200 or 250 kilometers per hour in the present day cars so this was your one uh, aeroplane in somewhere 1920s with which you were only able to achieve speed of about 160 kilometers per hour okay and uh, on an average it was found that if you have to cover a distance of nearly equal to 4000 kilometers using this particular plane then it was taking about 36 hours okay and you are not able to complete this distance in a single stretch because of many technical issues and uh, one has to actually take many number of stops as high as equal to about 10 so if you have to cover a distance of 4000 kilometers you have to take about 10 stops and the maximum speed which will be achieved will be about 160 kilometers per hour okay then a uh, little bit technology has progressed then this Douglas DC3 airliner has come in 1930s once again this is also the propeller is driven by the reciprocating engines only but speed of this particular airplane was nearly equal to uh, about 290 kilometers per hour okay and for the same distance of uh, for the same distance of about uh, uh, 4000 kilometers now it has uh, taken something about 17 hours and number of stops has also reduced to about uh, 3 okay so nearly equal to in 3 stops you are able to achieve this much distance okay then another variant which is of this category only but the which has come somewhere in 1950s but the only difference is that in place of a single propeller on each side uh, in dc3 this particular dc7 was having two propellers on each side okay and with this the average speed which was uh, kind of achieved is nearly equal to uh, 500 or i should say the maximum speed which was achieved that was nearly equal to 500 kilometers per hour okay then this is the present day uh, aircraft so you can see boeing uh, 777 jet airliner so uh, this particular aircraft is now having jet engine so the difference is earlier aircrafts which i have talked about these were having the reciprocating engines okay and reciprocating engines were used to rotate the propeller shaft now the present day high speed airliners are having jet engines these jet engines are nothing but the based on the ideal britain cycle here you are having some initial diffuser section then compressor then you are having uh, after compression the injection of fuel in a uh, combustion chamber where you are getting high pressure high temperature hot gases and these gases then are expanded uh, partly over the turbine in order to run the compressor and other auxiliary equipment of the aircraft and remaining are actually expanded over a nozzle in order to create the sufficient thrust for propelling the aircraft so this type of uh, jet airliner is having uh, speeds in the order of nearly equal to say 1000 kilometers per hour okay so this is a present day uh, i can say the jet engine based airliner okay now uh, so you can see that earlier whatever the uh, engines we were studying particularly till the second world war these were actually very low speed and for majority of these engines even the fluid flow analysis was done using the incompressible flow modeling and till that time this analysis was actually sufficiently accurate and there was no need of compressible flow analysis however after the uh, second world war so you can see uh, this is uh, bell x s1 so bell xs1 is the first supersonic aircraft so this is the first supersonic aircraft and this was also from somewhere in 1950s near the time of second world war 1940s or 
1950s and in this uh, uh, aircraft at that time about uh, uh, speed equivalent to Mach number of nearly equal to 1.06 was achieved okay so what is Mach number all these terminologies slowly slowly I will be introducing you to the while we will be going through this course so at the moment uh, just to briefly summarize you Mach number is nothing but equal to the ratio of speed of the flow speed of the fluid per unit speed of sound so a is the symbol for speed of sound so Mach number plays an important role in uh, uh, defining the compressible flows okay so uh, at the moment you just remember this definition and uh, how it is coming why it is important all these things we will see later on okay so with this uh, uh, first kind of uh, uh, supersonic aircraft Mach number of nearly equal to 1.06 was achieved so when you are going for such high speeds then actually you cannot neglect the compressible effects if, if you cannot neglect the compressible effects then using the uh, incompressible flow modeling is actually not accurate for example if you are having earlier uh, low speed airliners then you can easily employ the Bernoulli's equation for incompressible flow which is T plus half mv square plus mgz equal to constant considering that flow is considering that major assumption is flow is invisit ok so if flow is invisit then uh, we were able to successfully apply this equation but when the compressibility effect has become important then obviously we cannot apply this equation because our density will not remain constant ok so then the this particular equation is not applicable for compressible flows so we have to go for the little more advanced analysis by taking into account the compressibility effects ok so another uh, example let me give another historical example so uh, that has also uh, that is also considered as one uh, important uh, uh, development uh, towards the need and development of the compressible flow okay so that is one uh, Swedish engineer uh, D level he has actually demonstrated one turbine uh, steam turbine uh, somewhere in I think 1893 okay and that in that particular turbine what he has done basically he has used the set of convergent divergent nozzles so when steam was coming and it was interacting with the turbine blade say these are nothing but the turbine blades so when the steam was interacting with the turbine blades so what he has done earlier actually normal uh, routine pipes were used to uh, supply the steam to the turbine blades so in place of that he has actually specifically used this convergent set of convergent divergent nozzles and with the help of these nozzles his, he was able to achieve a speed of about 30,000 rpm revolutions per minute for the turbine shaft ok so that was the highest speed of that time and uh, these turbines were specifically designed using the steam and these were for actually uh, ships ok so uh, this is also considered as one important uh, uh, development towards the uh, towards the technological advancements uh, with the help of compressible flows ok then you see the uh, present speed this uh, BAC Concord supersonic airliner so this is nothing but in the name itself it is written supersonic so this will be having Mach number significantly larger than 1 ok so then it will be able to uh, give us nothing but the supersonic speeds ok so these can be seen as uh, the 
important uh, uh, important considerations towards the uh, development of the compressible flow so initial aircrafts were nothing but the low speed where incompressible flow analysis was sufficient enough to define its dynamics to predict its behavior but when the speeds of the systems have increased and become sufficiently high so that the the effect of compressibility cannot be neglected then using the incompressible flow analysis is actually not uh, uh, accurate so one has to consider the effect of compressibility okay now uh, let's introduce some of the basic fundamental concepts and uh, uh, let's try to first build up from the point what is compressibility so typically when we say a compressible flow immediately one keyword comes to our mind that a flow of variable density is known as compressible flow but in reality none of the fluid is there which is having constant density almost for every fluid there will be changes in density but still we analyze majority of our engineering problems with the incompressible flow situation so by just saying that uh, having variable density in a flow it does not complete the definitions of compressible flow okay so that's why let's try to uh, see this concept in more detail so compressibility is typically given by symbol beta okay so let's consider this with the help of a example so say i have an fluid element and this particular fluid element is having mass m and when this fluid element is subjected to some pressure p from its surroundings so p is the pressure subjected on this and this pressure is actually coming from its nothing but surrounding so when it is subjected to pressure p say it is occupying a volume v if it is occupying a volume v corresponding to this specific volume will be volume per unit mass okay so say small v is the specific volume corresponding to pressure p now we have shifted the same mass fluid element to some another flow field and in this flow field now if you see i have the mass same and in place of p pressure our flow field is such that that the surroundings are subjecting it to a pressure of p plus dp okay so it is having pressure of p plus dp if it is having a pressure of p plus dp because of the increased pressure pressure being a compressive force so you can see whenever i am subjecting the arrow of the pressure i am actually putting it towards the fluid element so being a compressive effect what it will try to do for the same amount of mass it will try to decrease its volume so if its volume is decreasing its specific volume will also decrease say the new specific volume is v minus dv okay so i can simply say that when i have changed the pressure by amount dp my specific volume has changed by amount dv so that is the change changing uh, pressure by dp is changing specific volume by amount dv so if we define that change in specific volume corresponding to dp change in pressure per unit the original specific volume of the fluid element that we call as nothing but our compressibility beta okay and while we write the definition of beta we put a negative sign over here so what does this negative sign signifies negative sign signifies that when you are decreasing the pressure when you are increasing the pressure volume is decreasing so this dv by dp ratio will become negative so in order to just make this quantity positive we are putting a negative sign or in other words i can also say the significance of negative sign is that 
increasing the pressure decreases the volume or specific volume of the fluid element okay is this point clear so this is the reason for putting a negative sign over here so this is one very very important equation okay however uh, still i would like to say that this definition is still not complete why it is still not complete the reason is changing this pressure dp does not only change the specific volume but it also alters the other thermodynamic properties of the fluid element okay a typical example is uh, if you see an air compressor okay even if you see a bicycle pump in case of bicycle pump even you are pressing from your hand only so amount of energy supplied is not that huge but still if in front of the bicycle pump whatever air is coming if you just put your hand over there you will be experiencing a slight warmth so a slight increase in its temperature okay however if you use an air compressor where you are changing the pressure by significant amount say you are changing pressure from uh, from say 1 bar to about 10 bar or 15 bar you will be having very high temperatures one another common example is a reciprocating piston cylinder based engine so what we do in case of a piston cylinder based engine we take atmospheric air in and that atmospheric air we compress okay when piston moves from bottom dead center to top dead center and in case of uh, uh, particularly the diesel engines compression ratio is very high about 20 to 22 and during that compression process the volume of given mass of air has decreased drastically and that leads to increase in its pressure but along with the pressure you will be experiencing that its temperature also increases by a significant amount and the amount is so high that temperature is sufficient enough to self ignite the diesel fuel okay so it means that changing pressure does not only change a single property that is specific volume it also alters the other properties okay so this particular equation only talks about change in specific volume with reference to changes in the pressure so it means uh, that it is not including the dynamics of the other properties so what we have to do in order to make this definition complete we have to include the variation of other properties as well okay so to make this uh, uh, definition more generalized what we can do uh, i will just try to uh, recall, make you recall the fundamental concepts of thermodynamics so when we use a compression process in a steady flow device so you will be remembering that in a steady flow device we represent compression process or a compressor by control volume something like this so this is our compressor symbol for compressor okay or i can say the control volume so this particular area is nothing but a control volume for a compressor okay so what i do here i supply some fluid mass say at the rate of m dot and if it is a steady flow device then mass which is going out that will also have we having rate m dot okay both will be having rate m dot and here if it is coming at pressure p1 and specific volume v1 here it will go out at pressure p2 which will be greater than p1 and specific volume v2 okay now when we achieve this compression process we consider that in a compressor steady flow compressor the fluid element moves at very high speed because of which particularly in case of a, a rotary or axial compressor and the speed is so high that it does not get sufficient time to exchange heat with the surroundings so it means 
heat transfer with surroundings is zero okay another important consideration which we take while we do the thermodynamic analysis is our flows are processes are either reversible or if not fully reversible at least internally reversible what do you mean by reversibility or internal reversibility so the basic idea is that if a process is taking place such that the variation of the property inside the system give me some idea about reversibility and internal reversibility okay so partly this definition is correct that if you are taking one path from a to b it is taking the same path from b to a okay but this definition is partly not fully complete okay so uh, i suggest all of you to go through the concepts of thermodynamics reversibility internal reversibility etc uh, i would just like to add one important point over here yes without leaving any effect on the environment this is also uh, one uh, good addition to this okay so one important thing i would like to add over here any uh, process becomes irreversible because of some dissipative effects okay so this is one important point if you have dissipative effects what are the dissipative effects such as friction thermal conduction mass diffusion so particularly when we deal with the uh, flows then say these three important points so all these things are nothing but the causes of irreversibility so these are the causes of irreversibility so i am not here to teach you thermodynamics fully so that's why i suggest you go through this concept in detail but i will just give you the uh, brief points which will be important in understanding so the point is all the dissipative effects are considered as nothing but the causes of irreversibility if during any process all the causes of irreversibility are absent if all these things are absent within the system boundary then we will be calling the flow to be the process to be internally reversible if these things are absent within the boundary and outside the system boundary then we will be calling the process to be totally reversible okay so there is no internal irreversibility and no external irreversibility okay so under that situation we will be calling the flow to be completely reversible in majority of the thermodynamic analysis we consider the processes to be irreversible uh, sorry uh, reversible and same is the case with compressible flows why in compressible flows we always considered the uh, always considers reversible flows uh, that i will explain you in the uh, later lectures okay so what i said that if i use a typical steady flow compressor then this operation is adiabatic okay adiabatic as well as it is reversible and as per the understanding of thermodynamics maybe in the subsequent lecture we will see at the moment you can simply uh, remember any reversible adiabatic process is nothing but an isentropic process so any reversible adiabatic process is an isentropic 
process. Now, if you consider a fluid element that is entering the inlet of this compressor, when the same fluid element is compressed, now it is compressed. So, when the same fluid element is moving, you will be experiencing its volume will slightly, slightly keep on decreasing and at the outlet, the pressure is highest. So, it will be having the lowest volume. So, I am just talking about a single fluid element. Here, you will be having a large number of fluid element, but I am considering a single fluid element. So, initially pressure is low, its volume will be more. As long as it will move across the compressor, pressure will keep on increasing and its volume will keep on decreasing. But one important point is, when we are doing this compression process, the other properties will be influenced by the way we are actually completing this process. So, in this particular process, what we are doing, we are doing this compression process in an isentropic way. So, if we are doing this process in an isentropic way, so this will go on how other properties of system should change. Okay? Is this point clear? So, basically this will control how other properties should change. So, I can say that, now I can say that I have a compression process inside a steady flow compressor, but that compression process is nothing but isentropic. So, I can call compressibility in this process as nothing but the isentropic compressibility. So, I will define one another variant of the compressibility, which I am specifically referring as isentropic compressibility. And in case of isentropic compressibility, I can say beta s, s is the symbol for entropy that is equal to minus 1 by v into del v by del p at constant entropy. So, now see this variation. Earlier, we were writing dv by dp. So, dv by dp because we were considering only the dependence of pressure only on specific volume. But over here, when we are considering the dependence of pressure on specific, uh, sorry, dependence uh, of pressure on specific volume, we are also now including the effect of other properties. So, in this particular process, this compression is achieved in an isentropic way. So, when I will be calculating this del V by del P, this del V by del P, I am calculating nothing but for a isentropic process. So, you can typically see on a PV diagram, if I have this as say some pressure P2 which is greater than P1 and this is my pressure P1, if I start compression from this point, then say this is my compression process and specifically say this is nothing but my isentropic compression process. Which compression process? Isentropic compression process. Okay. So, this will be my line. So, you can see that now you have this curve. If you have this curve, can you calculate del V by del P? Easily. So, you can see the slope of this will be del P by del V and 1 by slope will become nothing but del V by del P. At any point, if you find the slope of this curve, that will give you del P by del V and 1 by slope will give you del uh, uh, V by del P. Okay. Now, similar to the isentropic compression, we also have majority of the time the requirement of, for example, in an engine, uh, we have requirement of increasing the temperature. Okay. There are certain applications for which we require low temperature gas at the end of the compression process. Okay. Another important point is that unless or until required, we should not raise the temperature of the gas because in a compression process. Why? Because raising temperature during a compression process takes more amount of work input. So, if we are having some means to control the temperature during an uh, uh, compression process and if we can make the compression process isothermal, it will be consuming less amount of work. Okay. So, majority of the time we see in our routine compressors, 
which we use in our uh, uh, normal workshops with different machines you will be finding across the periphery of the compressor a number of fins are actually attached okay so these fins are nothing but provided to reject the amount of heat generated within the compressor to the surroundings okay and uh, even the high pressure ratio compressors are having liquid cooling systems also where water jackets are provided which actually cools down the uh, temperature okay so considering these aspects considering these aspects what i can say that isothermal compression process is also one very very important which is used in many technological applications so considering the isothermal compression we can define another variant of compressibility as isothermal compressibility okay so in case of isothermal compressibility what i will do i will write over here beta t where beta t is equal to minus 1 by v del v by del p at constant temperature so we know that compressing a fluid element will try to increase its temperature but if we can control the rate at which temperature is increasing and the rate at which working fluid is giving heat to the surroundings then we can basically maintain the uh, compression process at isothermal conditions and at isothermal conditions what will happen the initial temperature and the final temperature will remain the same so on a pv diagram if you represent a typical uh, isothermal compression process starting from the same state point you will be finding it something like this so say this is 2 dash when we have nothing but temperature as constant so we are starting from same point 1 but we are ending at some other point 2 dash okay so you can see now now the value of del v by del p for this isentropic compression will be different okay so in case of isentropic compression del v by del p was different when you are having isothermal compression then del p by del p is different so this is where it becomes important to introduce the other property along with this okay so that's why we have introduced over here entropy here we have introduced the temperature because any other third parameter which is kept constant that will affect the rate at which del v by del p is changing okay because if you don't consider temperature constant then what will happen if pressure and temperature are increasing simultaneously pressure will have tendency to decrease the volume temperature will have tendency to increase the volume and depending upon the combined effect you will experience how much volume is changing with reference to the unit pressure okay so that's why whenever we have considered the isothermal compression then effect of temperature is completely neutralized only pressure is having tendency to decrease the volume so that's why you can particularly see over here the slope of this isothermal compression is less if this slope is less one by slope will be higher okay is this point clear so this del v by del p for isothermal is actually higher is this point clear okay now <clears throat> this is about the uh, isothermal compressibility now majority of the times you will be finding that when we do compression other properties we cannot maintain constant because when i apply pressure obviously volume has to change then only compressibility is coming into picture because the fundamental definition is that uh, density or specific volume should change okay so and pressure also we cannot keep constant if we keep the pressure constant then uh, there will not be significant changes in the volume okay so that's why fundamentally if you see the primary properties entropy and temperature are the primary properties which are basically involved during a compression process so when we are defining the compressibility we are only talking about isentropic compressibility and isothermal compressibility and we are not considering the any term something like isobaric compressibility or isochoric compressibility okay now this compressibility is something 
which is uh, uh, not particularly related to only with the flow okay so this is something which is a property shown by almost all the fluids almost all fluids are having compressibility however some fluids are having less compressibility and some are having more for example uh, at one atmospheric pressure condition if you talk about the compressibility of the water uh, that is somewhere in the range of 5 into 10 to power minus 10 meter square per Newton. So, let me also uh, give you this uh, important point also. So, what is the definition of compressibility, uh, sorry, unit of compressibility. So, if you see compressibility is 1 by volume. So, it means 1 by meter cube into delta V change in volume is meter cube divided by pressure which is Newton per meter square. So, from here you will get unit of compressibility is meter square per Newton. Okay. So, for one atmospheric uh, uh, pressure conditions, the compressibility of water is 5 into 10 to power minus 10. Whereas, uh, at the same conditions, the compressibility of uh, air is somewhere in the range of 10 to power minus 5 meter square per Newton. This is for air. So, meaning is clear, very clear that for same amount of pressure change or for unit pressure change, your volume change will be by this much amount in case of water and this much amount in case of air. So, it means that air is having almost 10 to power 4 times more change of specific volume or density. less density for same change of pressure and this is then water. Here has nearly 10 to power 4 times more change of specific volume or density for same change of pressure than water. So, this is the reason that in majority of the flow situations water and other liquids can be easily regarded as incompressible flows because there for whatever change of pressure is happening corresponding to that changes in volume are actually less okay and uh, in case of here it becomes easy even for small pressure differences also to create the situation of compressibility okay Now, uh, let us try to see another important variation. So, beta in general form we have defined as minus 1 by V uh, dV by dP. Okay. Now, we know that specific volume is 1 by rho. So, if I substitute this over here, then my beta becomes d of 1 by rho, let me also substitute this, replace this with 1 by rho divided by dp. Okay. So, this will become minus rho times d 1 by rho will become minus d rho by rho square into dp how it is coming. So, if you are having d of u by v that becomes u dash v minus v dash u divided by v square. So, using this formulation you can actually obtain this expression. Okay. So, from here our beta will be equal to 1 by rho d rho by dp. So, you can see over here mathematically the negative sign has vanished and physically if you try to relate physically also you can justify this mathematical expression whenever you increase the pressure there is increase in density okay so mathematically and physically you are able to make over here the same sense up to this point is it clear now from this you can see that change in density d rho is nothing but equal to 
beta into rho dp so this is the amount of or uh, amount of change in density for corresponding change in pressure during some flow situation so this is an important equation when this change of density d rho when this change of density is less than 5% in any flow situation then we call this as nothing but our incompressible flow is this point clear so what i want to emphasize over here whenever initially i have started the definition of compressibility then i have talked about a stationary fluid element but in reality fluid element will not be stationary when we are talking about a flow situation it will be moving so the way i have explained in case of a compressor okay so when a fluid element is moving it means we have a flow situation so flow is only possible if we are having pressure difference okay so say i have a pipe and in this pipe at the inlet pressure is p1 at the outlet pressure is p2 and the difference of these two p1 minus p2 is something which is dp okay so if in this pipe the pressure is changing by amount dp and beta is the property of the fluid which is flowing through this pipe compressibility of the fluid okay then we can say that the change in density will be equal to beta times rho into dp and if we experience that this d rho is less than 5% then we will be calling that as incompressible flow and when this is greater than 5% then we have to consider the effect of considerable variations in density and we will be calling this as particularly compressible flow now this becomes very important over here that this dp for a flow situation okay so dp is nothing but differential pressure between two points so it means this differential pressure between two points will depend upon the length scale of the system okay for example if i consider over here pipe so the length of the pipe will decide how much will be change in pressure along with the other flow parameter okay so one important consideration while we specify the definition compressible flow we have to say that if variation of density for delta p change in pressure for the given length scale is greater than 5% then we will be calling the flow to be compressible okay so don't only relate it with the speed okay so say you are having very high speed flow but the length scale is of 1 mm thickness then what you will be finding in that 1 mm thickness your pressure drop is not sufficient high where your compressibility effect can come into picture okay so it means that for making the definition of compressible flow complete delta p pressure change we have to link with the corresponding characteristic length scale of the phenomenon which we are actually studying so say if you are having very high speed flow somewhere you have placed a very thin heated surface of 1 mm thickness and you only want to study the phenomena across the heated surface just upstream and just downstream then your characteristic length scale is very small corresponding to that pressure change may be very very small are you understanding my point so my important point is when we you are talking about compressible flow you have to say that whatever the delta p change is there over the characteristic length scale which is your main consideration in the phenomenon if that is causing a change of density greater than 5% then your flow to will be nothing but compressible flow another important aspect which you should be able to uh, you should be able to relate at this point that is 
the compress there is difference between compressible fluid and compressible flow so compressible fluid so basically compressibility is something which is a property of the fluid and this is shown by almost all the fluids to some extent maybe of very small but to some extent all the fluids show some compressible behavior okay whereas the difference between compressible fluid and compressible flow is that when you are having the considerable variation of density in a flow situation then only you say the compressible flow okay otherwise you say incompressible flow and for defining compressible flow your change of pressure should be connected to the length scale of the phenomenon okay so if change of pressure over the given length scale of the phenomenon is such that it is producing a uh, more pressure change then only we will be calling it as nothing but a compressible flow okay so now we will stop at this